to be honest, one of two men in this room right now who, um, who we can rightly call really the founders of the Muslim community, if not in, in, in our country, then even in the West. Uh, in fact, a lot of our grandfathers were, were, were counseled by them. I already introduced and had the pleasure of introducing Sheikh Abdullah Idris earlier this morning. And the second one is our dear beloved brother, Dr. Jamal Badawi. Dr. Jamal Badawi is prof Professor Emeritus at St. Mary's University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and he served there as a professor for both management and religious studies. During its May 2008 convention, St. Mary's University granted him an honorary doctorate of civil law in recognition of his promotion of a better understanding of Islam and contribution to civil society around the world. He completed his undergraduate studies in Cairo, Egypt, and his master's and PhD degrees at Indiana University. Dr. Bedawi is the author of several works on Islam, including books, chapters, and books and articles. And in addition to his participation in lectures, seminars, and interfaith dialogues in North America, Dr. Bedawi has been frequently invited as a guest speaker in over 38 countries. He is a member of the Islamic Judicial Council of North America and the European Council of Fatwa and Research and the International Us Union of Muslim Scholars. He has been serving as a volunteer imam of the local Muslim community in the Halifax region municipality since 1970. I'd like to welcome our dearly beloved brother and, 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 and teacher, Dr. Jamal Bedouin. And before you applaud, I'd like to ask you a, a humble request. This is for me, not from the organizers. And if you have any problem with it, then you can talk to me, inshallah. Um, um, a, a lot of us uh, utilize applause by physically clapping our hands in order to appreciate our speakers. And this is, of course, a cultural tradition. But at the same time, if we really feel the urge to expend some form of sound energy, then it might be even more beneficial for them if we just simply make dua for them, inshallah. So I ask you all to make dua for our speakers and our teachers. Jazakumullah khair. Dr. Jamal Badawi, please come. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam and in humanity for other guests, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. May the peace, blessings, and mercy of Allah be with you all. Uh, I cannot claim to be a founder of anything except maybe my family with five children, and more recently, the number of grandchildren grown up to 19. That's the only founding that I can claim. Um, after all the excellent presentation that were made and the variety of areas that has been covered, uh, I find uh, my job in a way tough, in a way easier also because I can only give headlines because you have already heard all of those details. The focus of this presentation actually is on the gap between the ideal, that is the norma normative teaching of Islam versus the reality based on experience that I'm sure many of you imams and other scholars have encountered within the Muslim community here. I'll go rather quickly because of time in about maybe five or six areas. First, the criteria for choice of spouse. The ideal has been explained in the various ahadiths of the Prophet wasallam that number one should be religiosity, number two should be character, but there is nothing wrong with other things like beauty and wealth, but it's a matter of the list of priority. The reality, however, seems to be different. People violate exactly the text of the hadith, uh, looking only for wealthy uh, beauty in just the sense of physical beauty, forgetting that there is another type of beauty that's not just physical, uh, or nobility of family. And one of the most common problems here in North America and in Europe as well, is too much focus on ethnicity. Some people even wouldn't give their daughter in marriage to someone, even from their own country, if he's from the wrong city or location in the same country. Secondly, uh, rules of engagement. Uh, engagement is not marriage, it is a promise of marriage. And there is nothing wrong with interaction between the two parties that are planning to get married to one another within the basic Sharia boundary of avoiding khalwa, that is total privacy, and also observing proper dress and proper behavior because they're not husband and wife yet. In reality, what I've seen on the ground and many of my respected brothers also before me and sisters spoke, 
that some Muslims go to one extreme or the other. On one extreme, it is the total westernized form of dating. Totally loose, they can go wherever they want and so on. But unfortunately, we find also over strictness in the, in the part of some parents thinking that this is decency and that this is protection of the reputation of their daughter. And I heard similar story to what we heard from Sheikh Abdullah and others. People will, one person told me when I was in Bloomington, Indiana in the 60s, the first time I saw my wife was on the night when marriage was supposed to be consummated. So, ta-da, here's your wife. That's it, you know. So that, again, there is some moderate way. And some people actually take a stricter opinion here more than what Sharia allows, so long as the question of privacy is avoided and proper behavior between the parties. Of course, that has been complicated further with many people raising questions. Can I call on the phone? Can I use the uh, private chat uh, on the internet with uh, my fiance? Anyway, and the third area, marriage and marital relationship. There are quite a few issues here, again, where we find a gap as well between the ideal and real. First of all, as Dr. Omar was reminding us earlier, the Quran describes marriage as mithaqan ghaliva, a solemn, sacred kind of covenant or commitment. Unfortunately, we heard also earlier some people who marry only to get immigration, marry on a temporary basis, in some cases even without telling the spouse, finish whatever they had to do in one country or the other and leave her sometimes even with a child a total uh, careless and callous type of attitude in dealing with other human beings. Uh, there is also the problem of lack of appreciation and understanding of the ideal that we find in the Quran, that there are three basic pillars of marriage, tranquility, uh, there is love, actually mawadda is more than love, sustained, serious, long-term love, and also compassion. And unfortunately, many people don't appreciate it. Uh, many people coming to ask questions to scholars and imams, they discover, the imams discover that uh, this great blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, bounty, is unappreciated, is forgotten. And that beautiful relationship is turned into hell because of even some trivial issues between the two parts. Sometimes you wonder how could adult people who are supposed to be sane and reasonable have this big fight on a small thing like here. Oh, my parents are going to visit me. Oh, how much time we spend here, how much we spend there. Sometimes you get into such a silly kind of issues that's not worthy of the whole concept of Sakina. Marriage should be declared that this is something important to protect the rights of both parties, to let everybody know what's happening. Marriage is not secret. But unfortunately, I'm sure many also who have lived in communities, leader, community leaders, know that some people just try to hide the marriage for some reason or the other. And we had some tragic examples earlier about people who get married and even they get children and their parents even are unaware of that. In the matter of marital gift, the ideal is clear in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that when mahr is easy and affordable, there is even greater barakah. There is more barakah even in this. However, unfortunately, in cultural practices of Muslim, whether in the West or even in the East for that matter, sometimes more so even in the East, so-called, or, or North, whatever the classification they have. Uh, you find that the matter of mahr become almost like negotiation, as if it's a commercial deal. And it's not only for material benefit, sometimes it's the prestige. I hear of some people coming from the Gulf area, that some girls become uh, or remain unmarried almost forever. They would be 40, 45 years old. Why? Because the parents were insisting on the right person with the noble stock and the wealth and ability to pay this, 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 and that. It's total uh, uh, upside down type of priority. The qiwama, that's another issue. 
which is subjected to a great deal of misunderstanding. My, under, my humble understanding of Qiwama, that it is a considerate, shuratic responsibility. I, I, I repeat, considerate, shuratic, from shura, responsibility. It's not a status or privilege or control or forsaking responsibility for that matter. Unfortunately, again, there is that misunderstanding. And sometimes the excuse that the Quran speaks about Qiyamah is actually is an excuse for power and control over people that we're dealing with. And shura is in the Quran. Shura is not only in politics. Shura in the family. The Quran mentioned that even in the matter of weaning of babies. So that unfortunately, again, we have this misunderstanding. Uh, the uh, mutual adjustment between the two parties, two different individuals, and as Dr. Omar rightly said and others, uh, uh, you don't marry your master. Uh, this is my wording, actually. The, the, the sense is the same. You don't worry, marry when you get married, whether male or female, to your master or slave, but to your partner. That's when the Quran speak about this uh, partnership. And that requires, because we have our own individuality, whether men or women, husband and wife, that they have to be mutuality also of adjustment to one another. But unfortunately, some people, whether men or women for that matter, say, all right, yeah, uh, we need to have mutual adjustment. I stay here in my place and you come and adjust to me. Or the reverse, the, the sense of compromise, half, meeting halfway, the sense of adjusting yourself in spite of your personality require also reciprocity on the other side. Now I'm coming to the area of dealing with marital problems. The ideal, again, we find in the Quran and Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam that you have to be proactive. You know who you're choosing, not just because somebody impresses you. Is this a proper person to be the mother of my children? And a mother is not just because she give birth and feed them. The one who'd really act as the first madrasa, the first school in the physical, moral, spiritual upbringing of the child. And with the complex life of families in North America, and many women who have careers who are highly educated as compared with other parts of the world. In fact, the in inclusion of prenuptial agreement, which is permissible in Sharia, you can include anything in the nuptial contract that does not violate Sharia, any condition. For example, a wife to be can say, I marry you provided let me finish the other two years remaining to get my college degree or provided this or that. These are all matters that one should not shy away from inclusion or including them in the marital contract because if you're not proactive and a problem may arise in the future, then it becomes a very difficult type of situation to, to deal with. The other aspect is expectations. Sometimes you get married and we have great expectation. Just to quote indirectly or refer to beautiful statement by brother Imam Siraj Wahaj, a very dear brother to me. Uh, a, a, a husband who tells his wife, oh, I wish you'd just be like Aisha. But he doesn't ask himself, I wish I could be also like Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa So I could be anything, but I want you to be like Aisha. And the wife wants her husband to be like Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or Abu Bakr, or Umar. But she should remain I'm obliged to try to match or emulate those great uh, personalities. This sometimes leads to a great deal of disappointment, and sometimes it could lead to the, this attitude of holier than thou. I want you to be like this, 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 and correct this, this, and that mistake, but me, God forbid, I don't have any to worry about, okay? The, that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam addresses the issue even when there is some dislike between husband and wife. Let no believing man, but in that context, husband, hates his wife. If he hated some aspect of her character, he will find other positive character. That realism. And if you look into ourselves and how perfect we are, 
which is not there, of course, how imperfect we are, I should say, then we can give allowance that others also might have faults like our own. We should allow uh, for that. And even when it reaches the point of separation, it should be, as the Quran say, بالمعروف, to leave or depart in decency, in kindness. Uh, unfortunately, many of the divorces, especially that take place in North America, are quite messy. The basic rule is that Muslims should both sides agree to a solution to their problem, even in the matter of divorce, according to Sharia. If both choose it willingly, they can seek conciliation, they can seek mediation, they can seek binding arbitration. Nobody can prevent them from doing this. You don't need a law to allow you to do that. You can do it, it indeed, but that requires both parties. But when party or the other or both are refusing Islamic solution, and the aim is simply how much money can I squeeze of him. If Sharia can give me more right, I'll go for Sharia. If the secular court give me more right, I'll go for court. So this reflect on the kind of orientation of some. The uh, one before last area, raising children. I think it has already been well said before, so I just mention it quickly. You teach more by your good example. لما تقولون ما لا تفعلون the Quran warned why are you saying something that you don't do but unfortunately the motto, motto in the behavior of some parents do as I say you know it but don't do as I do that doesn't sit well with the children the children are smart even in early age ask an experienced father and grandfather you think they don't know but they're picking they're scanning the environment and it leaves a deep imprint in their soul and their mind. So this is something we have to be very careful about. I'm not saying that we have to be perfect. We'll never be perfect. But just avoid sheer hypocrisy and contradiction. And also admit when we're wrong. If the, if the son or daughter come and say, dad or mom, you told me don't to do this, but you did it. Don't try to shut up. Who are you? I don't need a child, a little kid to advise me. No. Admit, that would show that you're not hypocritical. Yes, Sonny, I am sorry. I try not to do it again. I am weak as a human. So this way you strengthen the value that you're trying to inculcate in the first uh, place. Uh, secondly, what I like to call constructive, loving discipline, or maybe sanction might be a better word, and we have an expert already here Dr. Reda Bashira, unfortunately, I missed part of his presentation. So um, this is an issue which is very, very essential. And the neglect of the proper sanction and resort only to harshness or putting down our children has a far-reaching effect on their personality, self-confidence, and their character in general. We need to spend time with our children. This is our duty and enhance communication, even if they're doing something wrong, even if they did the worst thing. The worst thing to happen is to cut communication. Many people sometimes ask me, my daughter married illegally to a person who is not a Muslim. Should I tell her, I don't want to see your face again? Don't you ever come to near my house? I said, no, you don't do that. You may not go to a wedding as an expression of displeasure, explain gently, but never cut her again because you're throwing her just nowhere and she you might lo she might lose her dean even as a result keep the contact but make clear that this is not acceptable the worst thing is to cut communication sever communication with children unfortunately the reality again is some parents are too busy in their professions making money or just too busy in their little social circle meeting with their friends uh, for after isha prayer if they pray isha until dawn playing cards and wasting time, backgammon and all these kinds of things, but no time for the children, no time for the, for the family. There is also the question that arises quite frequently. Whose responsibility is it to raise the children? Sometimes the wife say, it is your job. You're, you're the head of the household. You're the qawwam. And the husband would say, I'm busy. I'm earning the living for the family. It is your responsibility. You're staying with the kids. 
Yet, the Quran doesn't tell us. It says, Ya ayyuhal ladina aman. And all believers is not only men or women. And by the way, sometimes mistranslations of the Quran miss this point by using sexist language. I've seen people translate it, Ya bani Adam, all men. When the Quran says, all oh, children of Adam, they translate it, all men. Okay, so amanu here, and it's known linguistic rule that a plural masculine includes male and female. So the address is to all, what, what does Allah say? Save yourselves and your families from the hellfire. It is a joint responsibility. Maybe sometimes a, a greater burden might fall on one side or the other, depending of course on the age of the children or type of activities. But it is a joint responsibility. Let's not exchange uh, or trying to pass, it, pass the buck from one side uh, or the other. Finally, relationship with others, especially families. Again, a Muslim family is not just a nuclear family. I'll use that in non-aggressive terms anyway. Nuclear, I call it nucleus uh, to be safe, family. But also extended relatives, arham. The Quran speaks a lot about arham. But as we heard also about sometimes the destructive role of the in-laws in a way that sometimes make them outlaws, in fact. Uh, I have several examples communicated to me. Someone who tells me, my mother, tell me I'll not be satisfied with you until you divorce your wife. I ask him, How, what do you feel about my wife? She said, it's wonderful. As a human, I have a shortcoming like me, but it's a wonderful wife. I love her. You have children. We have three wonderful children. But now I am perturbed. I'm afraid of facing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment with my mother. And that's what she's telling me. How do you face Allah with your mother displeased with you? What do you tell him? That's not. As there is responsibility to be good to parents, parents have responsibility also not to ask their children to do something which is forbidden or hateful in the sight of Allah, like divorce. So this is an issue that really we have to tackle and we have to make sure to be gentle still to our parents, but never give up our responsibility towards our spouses and towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, the good company within the family or others is very important in leaving its impact in our character and more so even our children. And it should not be based on ethnicity alone. You really should be very careful choosing the circle, social circle that we deal with. To conclude very quickly, there is definitely a gap between the ideal and the real. And I don't mean to speak only on the negative. There are many positive things. I'm not leaning uh, heavily on one side or the other. But I'm saying that in the spirit of not coming to pat each other on the back, but to be self-critical of ourselves as Muslims, because that's what the Quran and Islam teaches us. We need to be honest and admit our faults as a prelude to correcting them. So we need to bridge that gap between the ideal and the real. How do we do it? We have to be first or develop awareness of the problem rather than putting our heads in the sand. We need to change our attitude, and that's harder than changing behavior even. We need to have the correct knowledge that guide us in changing our attitudes and behaving correctly, knowing that the Quran and Sunnah, not the opinion of this or that, the Quran and Sunnah are the final and ultimate references for scholars and lay people as well. But we had, what we have to really guard against are some misinterpretations or even juris, juridical rulings or opinions that demean one side or the other, and that exists. Let's admit it. It is in our juris, juridical history. And to realize that no matter how famous great scholars in the past were, when it comes into conflict with the clear statements in the Quran and Hadith, then we don't say, I'm following this madhab, I'm following that sheikh, the Quran. If the sheikh was here and realized the mistake, he would correct it himself. That's how they said about themselves. They never claim infallibility for that uh, matter. So we have to be very careful. Maybe you have to sift through that heritage and remove the notions or ideas that are demeaning to one side or the other for that matter. If there is a problem, uh, we should seek help. And sometimes, especially husbands, Women talk when they have a problem. They try to reach out. They're not shy to ask for help. 
but some husbands, husbands in general, really, I've seen in my own experience, are too proud to admit, I don't have any problem, she is, she does. I don't have any problem. Go to family council, oh, she's at fault. So again, we have to be humble and seek help, ideally, through Islamic family council, people who combine reasonable, solid Sharia knowledge and also the skill of counseling. But otherwise, professional counseling, we can take it with caution so long as it agrees with our basic uh, thawabit, the permanent things that we have. Uh, we need also finally to have patience. It's not an easy thing. We need flexibility. And perhaps we need seminars, both on family as well as parenting. And I'm very glad I'm not just pointing one person. I'm many, alhamdulillah, have been doing that. But I especially have to give recognition uh, to our dear brother, Dr. Reda Bashir, and his wife, Dr. Ikram, for their production in this field in terms of books and holding seminars. I think this is something that hopefully will improve our situation and help us consolidate the cornerstone of a happy, solid, committed Muslim family. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi